A year ago today, the capital of Afghanistan fell to the Taliban and chaos unfolded at the airport in Kabul as American forces withdrew from the country and Afghans scrambled to escape. Over the weekend, Taliban fighters broke up a protest led by dozens of Afghan women by firing their weapons into the air. NTS Tayyab is following this for us and has the latest from Kabul. Good morning. Well, as the Taliban celebrates the one year anniversary of its takeover of Afghanistan and indeed the end of 20 years of fighting, the Afghans we've been speaking to say today is a day of sadness, anger and fear. The tumultuous end to America's longest war immortalized in these chaotic scenes. The Taliban's lightning fast takeover of Afghanistan just weeks before the United States' planned military withdrawal triggered such intense panic that thousands of Afghans stormed the Kabul airport in a desperate attempt to flee the country, some even clinging to a moving U.S. military aircraft as it rose into the sky and falling to their deaths. It's an anguish Sakir Razai and his family live with to this day. His 17-year-old son Zabi was found among the dead, while his 19-year-old son Zaki, who had also clung to the aircraft, hasn't been seen or heard from since. Take us back to one year ago. The only memories I have are that my children's bodies were mangled and torn to pieces, he says. It's one year that I've been searching for my son. This is the calamity that I remember. But for the Taliban, today is a day of joy as hundreds filled the central Kabul square just yards from where the U.S. Embassy once stood, waving flags and chanting, God is great. Rejoicing that it's back in control of a country it once ruled from 1996 up until the 2001 Allied invasion that followed the 9-11 attacks. As the Taliban celebrates its one-year anniversary of taking over Afghanistan, make no mistake, this is a nation that remains internationally isolated, with not a single country recognizing the Taliban government. And yet, the Taliban's day-to-day -day focus seems to be more about controlling the lives of women. They've told them not to go to work, have said girls over the age of 12 cannot go to most formal schools, and have placed restrictions on women's freedom of movement. Akif Mahajar speaks for the Ministry of Vice and Virtue, which has issued these decrees. The Islamic law permits women to travel alone for up to 48 miles without a male guardian, he says, but not any further because a woman is a creation of God that cannot endure difficult journeys. Can you at least see why people look at your government, look at your ministry with suspicion, particularly on this specific issue of women? No, he says, we don't listen to the world as far as our Islamic law prescribes. We will not yield to the world's unwarranted pressures. Despite the risk, some Afghan women continue to defy the Taliban. In a rare protest this weekend, around 40 women took to the streets of Kabul to demand their rights, chanting bread, work and freedom but were instead met with bullets as Taliban security forces fired live rounds into the air to disperse them. One year into the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan, and the nation also remains in the grips of what the UN considers the world's worst humanitarian crisis, after the Biden administration froze billions in assets from the central bank and foreign donors pulled vast amounts of funding that once made up three quarters of the nation's annual budget. Now, as the Taliban celebrates its one year in power and indeed the end of America's longest war, it has to be said that Afghanistan is a far less violent place than it used to be. But when you consider the fact that the Taliban has been stripping even the most basic of rights and that the economy remains in free fall, the future for most Afghans remains extremely bleak. Anne-Marie, Vlad. MTS, thank you. So joining us now is retired U.S. Colonel Chris Kalinda. He's also the author of the book Zero Sum Victory, What We Are Getting Wrong About War. Um, thanks for joining us. You know, you heard MTS uh, talk about uh, Afghanistan being a far less violent place. Certainly um, a reduction in violence is is partially what the Taliban uh, is is touting as one of their successes over the last year. It ignores the fact that, you know, a lot of the violence that was happening before was as a result of Taliban attacks. Um, but so the ultimate question is, it's a less violent country, but are the Afghani people safer? 
Well, it's a heartbreaking situation in Afghanistan. You've got 20 million people on the edge of starvation. You've got an economy that continues in free fall. And you know, we look back on this a, a year, you know, a year after the fall. And as from the United States standpoint, I mean, we've spent two trillion dollars over 2,300 service members uh, killed. To include six of my own uh, from my from my unit, uh, Chris Pfeiffer, Adrian Hike, Jacob Lowell, Ryan Fritchie, David Boris, and Tom Bostic, and and so I think the bigger picture question is what do we learn from this, and what do we learn from the repeated fiascos and disasters that we've seen in Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam and, and some of the more recent military interventions. And that's what I write about in Zero Sum Victory. Uh, so what has history shown us about the future of Afghanistan under the Taliban rule? Well, I think we've, we're in a dangerous situation of, of this sort of doom cycle that your report earlier began to reference, where the international community has cut off the Afghanistan from funding. The Taliban really don't have the funding to be able to run a functioning government. They're reverting to what they know, which is um, in enforcing some of these uh, religious laws that they um, that they interpret. And, and then the international community is not going to give more funding, so they're going to start looking for outside sources of funding. And that's where we got into this predicament in the first place in the, in the 1990s. Some uh, Republicans from the House Foreign Affairs Committee, they're set to reveal a, a scathing report on what they say are the Biden administration's failures in, in the planning and executing of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. As I understand it, the administration has its own report that it's working on. But how do you feel about the actions taken by the U.S. in its withdrawing from Afghanistan? Well, the Biden administration played a bad hand poorly. Hmm. And when, but when you look at the the broad uh, arc of the Afghanistan war, I mean, the Taliban offered to surrender in 2001, and the Bush administration said no. Then in 2010 to 2013, and the we were involved in talks with the Taliban, and I participated in those talks as the Department of Defense's representative. Yeah, you know, the Taliban's demands that we had that they had for us and we had demands for them, they're all pretty modest. And yet we wouldn't put the political capital behind really getting talk started. So then you beam forward 10 years, and we are left in a situation where we are creating an agreement with the Taliban that trades no troops for Taliban promises of no terrorism. So all the accountability is on their side. There's no accountability on their side. And, and then after that, the Afghan government just simply buried its head in the sand and failed to prepare during the 16 months between a Doha agreement and, and this, the, uh, the U.S. withdrawal um, whereas the Taliban were using that time very wisely, negotiating the surrender of all sorts of military commanders and, and political figures. And so that was part of what accounted for this lightning victory and then helped create this kind of military equivalent of the 2008 financial crisis where everything just sort of came crashing down. Uh, and Colonel, I'm glad that you point out um, th that some of the failures go back as far as the Bush administration, uh, because it was former President Trump who actually made that deal with the Taliban to remove U.S. forces from Afghanistan. That was something that the uh, Biden administration inherited. And as you point out, they were dealt a bad hand and they probably I don't want to second guess it because I'm not in the military. But but it just does seem that throughout the course of this forever war, there have been a series of bad decisions made by uh, all the administrations uh, that have come subsequent to 9-11. Um, and I don't know that there could be any other way to have done this. I mean, it was clear that the United States, uh, because of the Taliban housing al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, had to go to war. Uh, but I just don't know that if all of these years subsequent to those actions um, have made us any safer and have made life any better for the people in Afghanistan. I do know, though, that there are many former Afghan allies and their family members uh, who were left behind who have finally, some of them, reached safety in the United States. But there are still some that are there. Why is that? 
Oh, there's a, there's a whole lot to unpack there. Um, I think we, we need to do some real soul searching about why our military interventions continue turning into fiascos. I mean, the track record since Vietnam is unenviable. Mm -hmm. And, and so we need, we need to take a hard look at this. There needs to be some real national security reform. And it, it troubles me that you don't hear leaders from either political party talking about national security reform. Uh, so, so that's got to happen. The, the second thing is, is as much as we need to look inward um, on our own errors, at the end of the day, the, uh, there is only one entity that was, would have been able to gain buy-in from the Afghan people, and that was the Afghan government. But the Afghan government just simply never bothered to gain the buy-in from the people. It turned itself into a, pled a predatory kleptocracy, so this government of thieves, if you will, that spent its time stealing from its own people. And the Afghan people were so disgusted with their government by 2021 uh, that they voted with their feet in large numbers preferring the Taliban as the lesser of two evils. Now, I mean, just when you wrap your head around that, the Taliban is the lesser of two evils to the Afghan government. Um, it, it's, it's staggering. Could have done everything right, but with a government unwilling to, to um, gain the buy-in from its people, uh, we could have done everything right, wouldn't have mattered, still would have had these catastrophic problems. Um, in terms of the... In terms of our, our interpreters, I mean, one of the challenges as you had this, this uh, maelstrom, um, this panic in Kabul is the United States generally has nobody, has nobody in charge on the ground. There's nobody in charge of our wars. And so you have all of this planning done in these individual bureaucratic silos, a military silo, a state silo, et cetera. And, and so that inhibits planning and coordination. And, and, and so you saw the effects of that with this panic in Kabul. I mean, we didn't prioritize, to my knowledge, um, getting people, special immigrant visas, our former interpreters, U.S. citizens out. It was, it was this mad rush to the gates and a lot of well-meaning people wanting to get their friends out. But what it did was it left most of our SI, most of our interpreters, most of our allies behind. And I don't begrudge anybody from being able to get out of Afghanistan, but I think only about 10% of all the evacuees were, uh, were SIV holders, green card holders, American citizens. The rest were, were you know, good people. They were associated with the Afghan government or other non-governmental organizations, but they were not the uh, interpreters and um, and green card holders and American citizens. Mm. Uh, uh, Colonel Chris Kalenda, thank you, sir, for your analysis and for your service. We appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm going on a 1,700 mile bicycle ride called the Fallen Hero Honor Ride to visit the graves of my six uh, paratroopers who were killed in action and uh, support them in recovering from psychological injury and helping to build their dreams build their dreams. That's amazing. And also explains the outfit. Yes. Uh, but you. I see you continue to serve. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.